Good morning and happy Sabbath. We're grateful that you have decided that this is the day that the Lord has made and that here in our little park, yes, I like the outside of the church because it is like a park and we're very grateful that it is and that we are happy that you are here with us today. Uh, we are the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Santa Clarita and this is our facility and you are helping it to facilitate your Sabbath experience. And for that, we're grateful. So raise your hand if you wish that uh, the pandemic was over. Okay, that's unanimous. Ra ra yes, yes, Kit, I see, I see your hand. Uh, ra raise your hand if you wish you didn't have to wear a mask. Thank you for wearing a mask anyway. We uh, uh, appreciate that. No doubt, and we're grateful that in this whole thing, we can use this facility to give us the opportunity to have in-person meetings. I know that there are a lot of other churches who are not, and um, they're still online, and that is a great thing. Um, we have some, how shall I say, some people that help us every week, and I want to give a shout out to, to Birker, who is not here today, Travis, is at the helm, and we're grateful for what Travis does. But um, I want you to know that, that uh, Birker is a busy guy, and so the opportunity for him to, to not show up on a Sabbath gives him the opportunity to do other things, which we all appreciate. I also want to say uh, thank you to Brett, who uh, definitely sets this place up and gets it ready for us every Sabbath. But the thing is, we're, we're needing for you to also give us some feedback as to whether or not what we're doing is meeting your need for an in-person meeting or whether you're just sitting here uh, champing at the bit, waiting for when we can go back inside. And uh, I, 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 I feel that, but as my wife is very quick to remind me, we are still, we're still at Tier 3, Chris? Tier 1. We're still at Tier 1. Now, Ventura County has gone to Tier 2, and so some of the churches over there have uh, been allowed back in limited space. Our actual facility, I think, would be uh, very safe. I, I just want you to know that because we've had it deep cleaned. We have it cleaned every week. In addition to that, we have louvered windows that give great cross ventilation, and we have a clean AC system. Uh, these are all things that you need to know that I know, but maybe you didn't, and that we uh, would then also need a number of individuals who would be willing to help with like uh, temperature checking or taking everybody's information. These are the things that we're required to do uh, right now if we would like to be back inside. Um, the colder, wetter weather is going to come. Um, this year they're saying, <clears throat> maybe not too soon, you know, maybe we'll have a lot more hot weather, and I think that's good actually for the virus, because the more hot weather, a, uh, shall we say, a lesser flu season, okay? I'm getting some nods of heads of the medical professionals who know way better than me that that is a good thing. So you being outside today in the sun, you are doing uh, COVID intervention for yourself. You're, you're absorbing the, the little amounts of vitamin D. That is uh, something also that I want to tell you that the recent research has said we all need more of that. So if you're not uh, upping your D3, then this is, the, this is the official pastoral advice based on small amounts of information that I have that uh, this is being found to be very effective in raising your immunity, which is what we're doing by being outside. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, coming and, and being with us this morning. I'm going to invite Eric to uh, join me, and uh, we will proceed with our service at this point. Well, good morning. Listen to that amazing response. Good morning. 
Oh, there you are. Thank you, and happy Sabbath while we're at it, yeah? This week has been a, a week of a vis, visible, especially visible blessings and miracles in my life, and I suspect many of you can say the same thing, even if it's just getting out of bed in the morning, yes? Amen. So a lot to be grateful for as we worship together. We are about to have what is known in many circles as a responsive reading. I want to make sure that you have this in front of you and are prepared to sail when the, when the time comes. And it's going to come very soon. It's, it's at the back. It's at the back right now. And um, uh, you, will, you will see that there's also a, a little box. Would, would you hold up the, uh, the little thimble? Okay. Uh, we are indulging today in a discussion about how God communicates to, uh, with us in taste. And so uh, as Eric and I put this together, we said, wouldn't it be great if we used the emblems in communion as part of today? So don't be surprised. Uh, I'll, I'll explain a little bit more in just a moment. But at the back, if you did not pick up one of these magical little thimbles that are totally sealed and have a little tiny, tiny wafer uh, on the top and then a bit of grape juice underneath, then please uh, make avail yourself of that at this moment so that in a moment, okay, there's, there's our, our faithful deacon. Just raise your hand and he will, uh, John, he's right here. Um, he will get you one, okay? And Chris and Terry, did you guys get a, a communion elements? No, they didn't. No, okay, so... See Barry about that, please. Bar Barry, will, Barry will come to you. That's the marvelous okay. thing. Then That's I, awesome. Go I ahead. I have one roadmap. If you do, most of you do have this in front of you. I'm happy to see that. You'll notice that ahead of those uh, in elements as we receive them are the first three verses of number 400. And the after we receive them is the last verse. So I don't want that to be confusing to you <clears throat> as you hear it. That, that is the roadmap for today. So great that you're here. Excellent that God is here. And great that we can be together in God's name. Amen? Amen. Okay. If uh, I'm going to call at this time Ralph. This is how, how this, I'd like the responsive reading to proceed, if we will. If, if we could have all of the guys read with Ralph, you'll be reading the light part. I will help, uh, not help, I will be glad to be in the company of the ladies, and I will be reading the dark part. So, Psalm 34 and excerpts from... <coughs> I will extol the Lord. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me, and let us exalt the, his name together. I, I sought the Lord, and answered my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. And he delivers them. Taste and see that, that the Lord, Lord is good. good. Blessed, Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Fear the Lord, Lord you his saints, saints, for those who fear him lack nothing. Yeah. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Evil will slay the wicked, the foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants, no one who takes refuge in him will be condemned.
when Eric uh, recommended this hymn, I, I, and, and as I'm glad Tom is playing it, many of you know this tune, and you know it to different words. This is number 400. This is actually... And as, as Eric and I are singing it, I uh, want you to enjoy it as well. Uh, it is something that is from my past. The King's Heralds used to use this tune to sing other songs, but we're going to use it today to sing a song that goes together with the uh, theme of tasting and seeing. And we will be at 400 momentarily. This is starting for 509, and 509. you should be able to sing it too. You know okay. the tune, the Thank words you. are there. All who hunger, gather gladly. Thank you. Step up to the microphone. All who hunger, gather gladly. Holy manna is our bread. Come in wilderness and wandering here in truth, we will be fed. You that yearn for days of fullness, all around us is our food. Taste and see the grace eternal, taste and see that the Lord is good. All who hunger, never stranger, seeker, be a welcome guest. Come from restlessness and roaming, here in joy we keep the feast. We that once were lost and scattered, in communion's love have stood. Taste and see the grace eternal. Taste and see that, that God is good. All who hunger sing together. Jesus is Christ in living bread. Come from loneliness and longing. Here in peace we have been led. Blessed are those who from this table live their days in gratitude. Taste and see the grace eternal. Taste and see that God is good. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we're so grateful that we have this opportunity today to remind ourselves of how good you are. Thank you for the way in which you have led us in this last week and the way that you have protected us in ways that we know about and also ways we don't know about. God, we are grateful that you have answered prayers. People are well as a result of your touch and your healing. But Lord, there are many today that we know about on Facebook or we know about uh, uh, through seeing people and talking to people that they are not well. And uh, they, there are even those that are in grief today because those that were not well have, have now been laid to rest. Father, in this situation, it, we, we could be scared, we could be worried, we could be uh, upset but today we are choosing. We're choosing to be here. We're choosing to be together, to encourage each other. We're choosing to hear from your word and to taste and see that you are good, even when our prayers are not answered the way we might like. Father, accept our praise today. Though it be muted, though it be behind masks, Please, God, hear our hearts today as we say to you, thank you. Thank you for being our God. Please continue to love us as you have in the past, and we will love you with the strength that you give us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now is the time for the children's story, and Barry is here to present it, and we're so glad. Thank you. All right, look.
Look at all the kids coming up to the front. Welcome all you kids. Yeah. Right up, right up front. Great. Right up there underneath that tree would be perfect. Anywhere just as long as you're within the range, right? And I raised my hand up real high about taking these off. Woo! All right. Sheesh. Glad you can make it to Children's Story, kids. And all the other kids that are out there, too, that don't want to come up. I'm like on the front row right here. All right. My story today is kind of based a little bit differently than what you're going to hear Pastor Mike talk about, which is taste and see that the Lord is good. Um, that kind of hit me hard. So I was thinking of, of other things that we could uh, uh, taste and see and do in our lives because when it talks in the Bible about tasting this right here and see that the Lord is good. We want to go to scripture and find out if that's true. So Jesus says, you know, and Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no man deceives you. So Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So we need to base our truth according to this. Just, just like when um, in the United States we have a currency called, I don't know if you can see this, but this is a $100 bill. My, my wife let me take this out of the house. <laughs> so this nice, crisp $100 bill from the U.S. Mint, and how we know that this is real from the counterfeits that Jesus warns us about in the Bible, there's counterfeits in U.S. currency, too, that happens. So you can hold it up to the light and see in the grain of the, of the material images inside the paper. Also, you have codes on there which, which tell you it's real. There's other ways of they, the Secret Service detects to see if it's real or if it's counterfeit. One of those is, <clears throat> same with the Bible. If you know your Bible, and you know what's true. You know what's a counterfeit immediately, right? Let's keep it simple, right? Is this a $100 bill? No, wait, 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 wait. It says 100 Whether it's from a Milton Bradley game or Monopoly money, this is a $100 bill, right? Could you go to the store and buy something with that? So we kind of have to discard that as... Is it's not real right so we discard that let's put that in the trash can right there and but see this right here we know that this is you got caught. what wait we don't we don't want to do that do we in a moment how about have, in a moment we're gonna have communion how about this yeah. one right here remember this $100 bill from seeing it before well it looks good and we want to take advantage of that but then wait we need to look at this over and realize it's only one-sided so we know that this is not a $100 bill we'll ground file that right there then we get into yeah three $100 bills front and back right so here's how you tell whether you have a real $100 bill or not. Whew, hope my wife isn't watching. Let's do this. Whew. All right. Secret service right here. No. I can tell. I hope I'm right. But that is not a $100 bill. Let's see what else is in here. Yeah, $100 bill, front and back, right? Wait, no, we gotta get rid of that. That is not a $100 bill because I know the truth. I don't work for the Secret Service, but I know what to detect. 
So with this one, it feels like a $100 bill. It's got the texture. And then when you take these off, you can see that you got the right one with all the other traits. But that's what I love about today's sermon. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And also we need to read that Bible and feel it in our hearts and know that it's true. So with that said, I'm going to give that back to my wife. <clears throat> All right, let's pray. Let's close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for these kids that are in front of us, um, even in the back rows, that uh, want to know that we can taste and see that your word is true, Lord. And we, we know that, uh, that you can lead us into all truth. And we pray this in your loving name. Amen. joy. Verses 1 through 3. As you noticed, uh, Barry was doing the children's story and I was going around making sure that you got some of what uh, Chris was very successful in uh, locating on Amazon. And uh, when I talked to my family last night, they were saying, yep, uh, the military has been needing this kind of communion service for a very long time. But I'm also very sure that these little thimbles that have a wafer on the top um, are now very, very, very popular across the United States, especially if you think about the fact that there are many churches, in fact, the congregation who meets here on Sunday, there are many churches who have communion every Sabbath or every Sunday, okay? So they're... they're uh, customers of this company, I was surprised, first of all, how small they are, but it is a symbol. It uh, does remind me, though, of when Jesus changed water into wine. You remember that story? It's a feast. It's a situation where people are expecting good food. And I know that you came to church today expecting good spiritual food food. And so we're starting out, as, as Eric and I put this together, we're starting out with these symbols. And you're thinking, uh, are we having communion service right now? And I know that there are some of you who may think, you should have told us, Pastor, so that, you know, we could have spent this week, uh, you know, asking God to forgive all our sins. Well, I didn't. I thought about it, but I didn't. Because I want you to know 
that in this very moment, um, we can appropriate these symbols which have been elevated by the use of our Savior at a Passover meal. Before the manna, Eric, before the manna, there was Passover. Let's not forget that Jesus was having Passover when he was eating that, what we now call the Last Supper. Yes, yes, he had finished his ministry, and during that time he had said, I am the bread of life. He'd also said, I am the light of the world. He had also been to that aforementioned wedding, in which case he changed the water of the traditional understanding of God. I hope you caught what I just said, because I'm going to say a lot with just a little. He changed the traditional understanding of the people, the water of purification, into the wine of the new kingdom. Yes, yes, yes. We, we know what he said to his mom. You know. Woman? Can you imagine he talked to his mom like that? Woman? I, do you think this is the right, the right time? I'm, I'm not sure it is, Mom. But then it, he went ahead and did what she asked. Recently I read... Um, what Ellen says about Jesus' growing up years. And I, I was shocked. I, I want you to know that part of those people who gave Jesus a hard time was his mom. Maybe you never knew that. But his mom wanted him, very much wanted him to be accepted by the traditional religious group led by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. She wanted her boy to be accepted, and she pressured him along with his brothers and his father. She pressured him to conform, but he would always come back with a thus saith the Lord. Or, you know, Mom, it doesn't say that in Scripture. And yet again at this feast, at this moment of tradition, they ran out of the juice. They ran out of the juice. And it's a critical mistake on the part of the catering. And I don't know if Mary was part of that group, but she goes to Jesus because she knows that Jesus can fix it. Now, I don't care if you remember anything else about today. But you can say, I went to church and I heard that Jesus can fix it. And what did he fix it with? He fixed it with the fruit of the vine. The, the, the meal had already been prepared, but he changes the water of purification because if you remember, they were those big stone jars, those big uh, earthenware jars that they, he, he told them, take those and fill them. And they filled them with water and they watched the water go in. And no, they... They didn't grumble too much, but they were very curious. Why would you serve water instead of wine? Well, then he said, take it to the mater d', and he did, and he dipped in, and he was curious too. And when he pulled out the laver and looked, it was the fruit of the vine. And then he tasted it, and he said, oh my goodness, catering got it wrong. <laughs> You're supposed to serve the good stuff first. And then when the guests have, the Bible says, had their fill, I'm going to interpret that a little more widely and say, when they're not noticing as much, okay, when they're not paying attention as much, why? I'll leave that up to your own imagination. Then you serve the lesser quality stuff. <laughs> But they'd flipped it. Jesus flipped that, and he said, no, it's the stuff that comes last. It's the stuff that comes later that is the good stuff. You've had all of this time in Israelite history to have the regular stuff. Now it's, it's time for the good stuff. Now it's time for you to taste and see. So I'm going to invite you 
to uh, get these little, little gadgets. I, I call them gadgets because somebody had to design this, and I, I think it's pretty cool. Um, this is my body, which is broken for you. Take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. Okay, this is the text that we associate with the moment in which Jesus took bread that had, you know, that was on the table for for uh, uh, the Passover meal, and he uh, broke that bread in the typical Middle Eastern fashion where you're going to tear off a piece of bread and you're going to dip it in some kind of sauce. You break the bread. You tear it. Any of you been to a wedding lately? Yes? These tents in this park are set up in exactly the fashion that uh, the new Mrs. Whitley wanted them. We recently had Jason uh, and, and Roxana uh, Whitley's wedding right where you are sitting. Okay, and they did have a cake. What did they do with that cake? Do you remember what we do with cakes at weddings? What do we do? We, we just leave them, right? No. We cut them. Are you now seeing a correlation between breaking bread and cutting a cake? You're never going to go to the wedding reception the same from now on. You are cutting a covenant. Jesus, Jesus takes the bread and he breaks the bread. In a traditional service, uh, you will watch, and the pastor is left usually with a piece of the communion bread, and in the presence of everyone, he does that symbolic move of breaking the bread. Well, today, uh, we have these, and so I'm going to ask your jaws and your teeth to perform the task of breaking the bread, and you will then ingest the symbol of taking Jesus into your life. We practice an open communion, I want you to know. So if you profess Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you are wanting to have him in your life, then this is the physical manifestation of that choice. Is that easy to understand? I hope even the kids understand that. That's why I pass these out to kids, because unlike my upbringing, I want your kids to know that Jesus wants to live in your heart. And this is one of the best ways to teach that. So he said, take, eat, this is my body. I want to commend the cook. That wafer goes down very quickly. We have people in this church that make much better communion bread. We'll get that next time. Now you get to open the second seal, and inside is literally, I've never seen such small communion cups. And you know that I'm much more for a big feast and a big meal, but we're doing this little taste test today because it fits in with what we're learning about God communicating to us. So he takes, if you remember when we did Passover communion, he takes the third cup. If you read the even the Messianic Haggadah, which is the service of Passover, you know that there are four cups. There are four times when a cup is taken and there is a drink taken. This, my friends, is cup number three, cup of salvation. Drink ye all of it. Kids, I'm going to do what my mom let me do. Stick your finger in it, get it all out. Because it's good. Taste and see that the Lord is good. And yes, the, they offered Concord grape juice, so that is what you're tasting. I'm sure there are other concoctions that they put in these things and sell them. But we went with the Concord grape juice. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Verse number four, Eric. <laughs> with joy.
time. I, I need to hear it one more time for myself. And thus with joy we meet our Lord, His presence always near. Is it such friendship that we see and praise Him here? We see and praise Him here. I want to say a special thanks to Brian Wren, uh, born in 1936, I'm wondering if he's still with us, but it doesn't say. But those are the sentimental words that we can say about the fact that we came here today. We came here today, and thus with joy we meet our Lord, his presence always near. Thank God for the way in which he stays with us, in, is in such friendship, such friendship that we see, better known. We see and praise him here. We, we see. How do we see God? Well, I'm going to say right now, you are seeing God in the faces of the people around you. You are seeing God in the nature that we have the joy of meeting in today. That was, I think, six weeks ago we were talking about Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. So it is with great joy that I see you here. I hope it is with great joy that you come. Amen. Amen and amen. I do not. Okay. I'm just starting. Okay. I mentioned already the idea of Passover, and I want us to just revisit that in our minds together. Uh, the Exodus is there for you to read again, but I want us to, to think of the feeling that they had at that moment. In fact, uh, we talked about it already this morning, the feeling that you would love to be, and I'm going to use a new word, delivered. Would you not love to be delivered from COVID? To be delivered from this situation that is keeping you from living the life that you are used to living. Well, it was the same feeling that welled up in the hearts and minds of the people of Israel as they anticipated a deliverer. Forty years earlier, Moses had thought at the ripe old age of 40 that he was going to be the deliverer. Yes, he'd been pulled from the Nile. Yes, he'd been prepared to be the next pharaoh. Yes, he had benefited from all the wisdom of Egypt. He was trained in everything, and he had excelled. And yes, he was neck and neck with the other uh, 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 pharaoh candidate that was being put, to, put forward with, uh, by, by the, the priest of On, the sun god. And yeah, they've made a movie. You know, they've made a movie about Moses. But, you know, sometimes they get it right, sometimes they don't. This, in this case, yeah, they, they got it right, and the animated movie is fun, and they play together as, as boys growing up, and they race their chariots together and all that sort of thing. But now he's 40, and he thinks that he's the one. And then he does that, you know, that move that he'd learned in boot camp, Egyptian boot camp. He does that move on that... Egyptian taskmaster as a way of announcing himself to the poor Israelite that was being beaten. Only to find the next day that his message had been completely misinterpreted. Are, are, are you going to kill me like you killed the Egyptian taskmaster yesterday? And he realizes the communication has gone completely awry. They're not going to look at him as the deliverer. They're going to look at him as a murderer. Not only the Israelite people, but then also the Egyptians. And in that moment, he realizes he has completely lost the race for next Pharaoh. He has completely ruined whatever it is that God had planned for him. And so he jumps on his fastest Arabian horse and he runs into the desert. 
he is a deliverer now in exile. And my friends, God is so, so loving, so kind, but then also so interesting in the fact that he takes another 40 years to reconstruct, maybe first deconstruct and then reconstruct the life of Moses. And then he comes back. The ten plagues, followed by or ending with the death of the firstborn. But only in those houses that were not covered with the blood of the lamb. Only in those houses where there was a son who was part of a family who did not believe. In times, in weeks past, we have talked about the difference between foolish and wise, and that this is why we're told we're not supposed to call our brother a fool, because basically we're calling them an unbeliever. So we could say in Egypt that night, when the death angel passed over, there were foolish and wise. There were those who were interested in listening and those who were not. The hyssop branch was pulled off of the the, the, the bush, and, and, and it was dipped it was dipped in a bowl of, of lamb's blood. Yes, kids, it sounds icky, and in many ways it is. But then just talk to the butcher. He does this every day. And that branch was then used as a paintbrush, and, 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 and it painted the, the lintel and then the doorposts. And if you think about it, it as the blood dripped, down those doorposts and from the lintel, it formed the cross. So this thing that we just did, where we are tasting and seeing, this thing we just did is symbolic of that moment when Jesus offered, literally offered up his body and his blood. How do we know that that text in Psalms came true? where it said no bone in his body would be broken because, yes, the centurion came by with a hammer. Okay, so I'll make it G-rated. He broke the legs of the other two guys, but when he came to Jesus, Jesus was already dead. Don't forget, my friends, Jesus said, I will be the Lamb of God. I, I will lay down my life. John said he's the Lamb of God. Jesus said, I will die on my own terms. The disciples didn't understand. I hope you understand that, yes, the Romans and the Jewish leaders set the scenario in place, but Jesus died before that centurion got there with the hammer. Why a hammer? Well, ask me later. It has to do with how you speed up the death of somebody on a cross. They didn't break his bones. Scripture came true. He had no broken bones when he went into Joseph of Arimathea's tomb. And so it was that the, the Israelites on that night took and did exactly what they were told. They took that lamb, they, they used its blood to signify their allegiance with the king of heaven, the one that was going to be their deliverer. And when the death angel came, he went over the top. He passed over. So yeah, we, we have what we call communion, but really it's a reenactment of us saying we have the blood of Jesus on our doorposts of our heart so that when there is judgment, when we are looked at, we are not seen in the eyes, uh, by, by the eyes of God as someone who deserves to die, someone who has said no to the salvation that God has to offer through Jesus, we have said yes. And we signify that by the blood and we eat the lamb. Now there did come a time in Jesus' ministry when he said these words. Eric and I talked about it this week and we said, yeah, that's, that's definitely something we should say on Sabbath. Let's not forget that there was a time that Jesus actually said in this context, to his followers, you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood if you would like to have part with me. 
and there was a whole bunch of people that went, ill, ill, that's sick. He's touched in the head. What is he talking about? Cannibalism? No. He was referencing the symbol that it had started with Passover. Actually, actually, it had started right out of the Garden of Eden when a lamb was to be brought and sacrificed. He was the chosen one. He was the Mashiach. He was the one who would come that Eve knew about, that, had, that story had been passed down from generation to generation. And those who had believed including Abram with his son Isaac on an altar where he believed that God would send something else to take Isaac's place, and sure enough, he did. That whole history comes down to that moment on the cross where everything that had been pointing forward was fulfilled. Jesus fulfilled that entire history in that moment, including not having his bones broken. But there they were, those Israelites, and, and then what my father used to like to call those hangers-on. The, <laughs> the Bible talks about a mixed multitude. People who were watching the fortunes of the Israelites change over the days of the plagues and realizing that the uh, Israelite nation was going to leave and that they were going to leave behind a pretty devastated Egypt and so they grabbed on to the next best thing. And they participated in the leaving. I don't know if they were participants in, in being part of households that had the doorpost and the lintel daubed with blood, but they left with them. So you have this group of people who now hear the command. They've got their traveling clothes on, that's what they were told. They ate their meal standing up. It was the first drive-by communion. Yes, I did that once as a young pastor. As people were coming back from foot washing, we had the deacons standing at the door to the sanctuary, and you took your bread wafer and your juice cup, and you went and sat down. I got an earful about that, even though I thought it was a very economical way to save time in a long communion service. <laughs> oh, we, we don't like drive-by communion. You know, we want to do it the old way. That was fine. We did it the old way. But here you have people who have been given specific instructions. They have their traveling clothes on. They are in anticipation of finally, finally after 430 years being delivered. I want you, I want you to put yourself in their position right now and say to yourself, when am I going to be delivered? Is there anticipation in your heart? Or are you just hoping that COVID can go away so that you can just go back to being whatever it is that you thought you were supposed to be before COVID? This pastor believes that we should not go back. And I mean a lot of things that we may want to go back to. We should be asking God, asking God right now, what is it that you need us to step into? What deliverance are you interested in giving us? Maybe it's deliverance from some of our ideas about being a Christian. Have you ever thought of that? Maybe we need to be delivered from some of the traditions that make us feel comfortable, but those traditions have not been helpful to the kingdom of God. And he has promised that he is coming, he's going to come and he's going to deliver all those who want to be a part of his kingdom. And there are some things maybe in our lives that are holding us back. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you, maybe COVID has come along and given us the opportunity to desire deliverance. Deliverance and, and e e emancipation. Let's use some big words today. No longer slaves to a, a, a slave economy. I hope I'm, hope I'm touching on some double entendres right now. 
okay? You ever thought about why lettuce is so inexpensive in your Walmart? I'll just leave that question and let it just hang there in your mind, okay? But maybe we need deliverance from the slave economy of this world. And we need to trust a savior. We need to trust a deliverer that, 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 that has been designated to be the one who will lead us out. And no, <laughs> it's not going to be like it used to be. We're going to go to the promised land. A land that has been promised to our forefathers. Yes, my daddy and my granddaddy died preaching that Jesus was coming soon and that we were going home. Now, how do you feel today? Are you ready? Are you interested? Are you longing to taste and see what God has for you next? Or are you going to be like the Israelites? Because, you know, there's all sorts of Israelite stories, right? So they're in the wilderness, and um, they got tired of manna. Yes, manna cotti, manna burgers. And recently my wife has helped me understand uh, through the reading that she has done <laughs> that, in fact, God made it so that manna could taste like, this is about taste today, right? Manna could taste like anything you wanted it to taste like. So that connection between your brain and your tongue that God made, both brain and tongue, he could make it taste like manicotti. He could make it taste like a meatless burger or a chicken burger. He could make it taste like anything you could imagine. This is the God we serve. And it's not something that I have known all my life. So now you know it. You know that God will give you all that you need, and he's going to make it taste good. How's that? Is that a promise you can live with going forward in COVID? Can you be excited about what is next? Uh, can you be interested in being delivered if what is next tastes better than what, what you're eating now? I'd say, hmm, when's lunch? <laughs> you know? It, and so I'm talking about an attitude here. I'm talking about a desire. And, and I think that, that when you come next week, we'll talk about smell and how that uh, helps with that desire for what you want to eat. Because as you come home, like I do sometimes, and I love the popcorn that my wife makes, and I open the door, and the whole house smells like popcorn. What, do you, what, what happens in your mouth? You start saying, I can already taste it. And then you want that bowl, and you want to you know, put on it what you want, and you want that popcorn. So I'm, I'm, I'm dealing with your anticipation here, and I'm telling you, this is one of the ways in which God communicates His intentions to us is through taste is one of the ways in which God communicates. I'm going to say something to you because it was impressed upon me this week. When I think about heaven, I say, if you don't eat, will you die? I know, I can see the wheels turning. We're in heaven now. Just imagine. If you don't eat, are you going to die? No. Yeah, I saw some footage recently of some underwater stuff. So one of the things that I'd like to do in heaven is swim with the sharks, swim with the fishes. The little program we watched was about an octopus called My Teacher, the Octopus. We're going to get to be able to submerge in the water and not die. So I ask you again, uh, if we don't eat, 
are you going to die? When we're in heaven with, after the big change, we will eat for pleasure. Because again, you're answering correctly, I believe, if you don't eat when you're in heaven, you're not going to die. So why would God give you something to eat except that he was giving you something to make you happy and joyful? In other words, he was gonna co he's communicating to you his character, his love, the, 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 the thoughts that he wants you to have about him. He's communicating those to you through taste. Now, this side of the big change, as I call it, this side of the big change, uh, we, we have to eat. And, you know, Adventists are real big on eating the right stuff. Okay? And, and, and now, because of COVID, <laughs> there are millions and millions of people who are very interested in eating the right stuff because they want to survive. So now, instead of just eating for pleasure, a lot of us are realizing that some of those, <laughs> what do we call them? Sinful pleasures. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, and we see the pounds packing on and we say, oh my goodness, I shouldn't eat that. Well, what if we're saying to ourselves, there is a bunch of stuff we should eat. Okay, so now I'm going to spiritualize it. And you all would do the same if you were talking to somebody else. We have to ask ourselves the question right now, are we taking in are we taking in what God is communicating to us in our lives through taste? Are we indeed tasting and seeing that the Lord is good? Jesus is the one who called himself the bread of life. He wanted to put it in terms of what you eat so that people would understand the meaning of the, 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 the symbols that we just partook in. That when you take that in, you are changed. You are given that ability to live. That he is, in fact, the, what do we call bread? The staff of life. We call him the God of life. He is the life giver. And so this is the, the thing that he is communicating to us. When you take me into your life, when you choose to have me in you, like I am in the Father, you will live. You will live. Now, I love the, co the things that are not coincidental in the Bible, the things that I think are planned from the beginning. Uh, where was Jesus born again? Eric's right. City of bread. Beit, city, town. Lechem. Which, by the way, is only one vowel point different from the other Hebrew word, that you hear at weddings, come on now, l'chaim, which is the word for life. L'chaim, 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 l'chaim. Jesus is the bread of life. It's poetic. L'chaim, l'chaim. Isn't it wonderful how it all fits? The bread of life is born in the house of bread. And yes, it was Augustus Caesar, you politicians out there, who made it all happen. So yeah, uh, don't be worried. What is it, the 3rd of November? Don't be worried. Augustus Caesar brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem where they were supposed to be. How's that? How's that for your, your concept of God right now? That no matter what happens in the very near future in North America, a God whose word will be fulfilled. I don't know. That, that, that gives me a lift. Does that give you a lift? Okay, so if we're trusting that God, if we're taking him into our life and we're tasting what he has to offer and we're seeing that it's good, I'm, that's the feeling that I have right now. It's like, you know, a really, really juicy bite of, 
of Scott Scotto's manicotti. Yeah, see, everybody laughed. You tell Scott, everybody laughed. Okay, tell him. Because we know, those of us that have eaten, whoo-hoo, we've eaten Scott's Italian food, and he is Italian from New Jersey. Okay? We know that it's, it's some of the best Italian food because he made the pasta, and he made the sauce, and he chose very carefully the cheese that he was going to use. And so you know it's going to taste good. And that first bite, oh my goodness, the anticipation. You can hardly bear to have somebody pray over it because you want to get into it. So that, that's, the, that's the feeling that I'm hoping you're connecting with this morning. I'm hoping you're saying, man, I want more. I want to get into what God has been offering all along and now is giving us so much more understanding, so much more understanding about what he has been feeding us. So that when he stands up and says, I am the bread of life, the manna that your forefathers ate, that's me. I want it to sink in for you today too, that he communicates to us with images of food and then he actually participates in an old service which he starts at Passover and says, yep, this is me. If you want to get to know me, understand this. And here is the communication. It comes through your tongue. And not because you're talking, but because you're eating. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So the answer to my question is, if, if you don't eat, are you going to die? No, not when you're in heaven. But yes, if you're here on earth and you don't eat, you're going to die. I think that's a, a spiritual lesson for us all. If you are not taking in the bread of life, if you're not feasting upon the word, John calls him the word, the word that became flesh, the word that became flesh that said, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. So I guess the, the point of today is, if you don't eat spiritually, you're going to die. So I don't know if that motivates you. It sure motivates me. Because you see, I do not want to die the eternal death. I want to live a life with the life giver. And, and, and his invitation is to say, hey, look, the kingdom, the kingdom of God is here. Would you like to start living that eternal life now? And I say, yes, COVID notwithstanding. Yes, election notwithstanding. Uh, chaos in the world notwithstanding. I want to be a part of the kingdom of God, a card-carrying member of Jesus' group. And he says, okay, then uh, eat my body and drink my blood. Be a part of this group by letting me be a part of you. So that when you go about, this is the, this is the difficult part now. I've, I've, I've told you the spiritual part, but now <laughs> as a result of what that thing will do, when, what he will do in your life, you're going to live a different life. If you think that taking Jesus into your life means that you can live whatever way you want, you need to think before you eat. Because, you know, there's this other thing about taste. It also warns you when something is poisonous. I mean, it was not for, it was not for no reason that kings used to have tasters because they didn't know that somebody might have slipped something into their manicotti. And so they made the taster eat it first. And if he dropped over, they didn't. So that's why the text says, taste and see that he is good. Because your taste is also a way of uh, making a determination whether it's good or bad. But I'm, I'm, I'm here to tell you this morning... God is good. Didn't we just sing that? God is good. And he's inviting you to taste and see that he is good. My friends, 
uh, I'm hoping that by uh, being here together, you will take advantage of the opportunity to look in somebody's eyes and just tell them, God is good. And by saying that, you will be saying, I have taken him in to my life. Would you like to try? You see, this is, this is the, the sent part. We have, we have come and we have gathered. Now we are sending ourselves. We are listening to the Spirit of God and he is saying, go and tell other people that God is good. He tastes good. The way he communicates with me is good. And as a result, I'm willing to live a very different life. That life is the unselfish life, my friends. It's the life that Jesus lived. And we are saying, by the communion that you just took part in, we are saying we would also like to live that unselfish life. In this world, right now, in the middle of COVID. So yes, brass tacks, down to the bottom. This is where it you know, the rubber meets the road, all those phrases. Eric, let's sing a song. Because this is what we do. And again, I want to thank you for the songs that you've chosen because they have words, which you have in your hands, that this week you may be able to be reminded of what happens when you take Jesus into your life and the choice that you make to be part of his kingdom. Amen. Before that song, I've been impressed to share this scripture with you. Amen. Christ, our Passover, is sacrifice for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Amen.
this opportunity that we are being offered every time we come together, every moment that we are gathered, as you've said, two or three gathered together, be it on Zoom, be it on the phone, be it in person. When we gather together, God, we want to thank you for being the, the bread of heaven come down to earth to give us the communication, to communicate to us who you are, what your intentions are towards us, and what you would like us to be as we go forward from this place into the rest of our eternity. Lord, we look forward to this next week. If it goes by as fast as last week did, we're going to need your help to remind us to stop and eat. Please, God, wake us up earlier in the morning if we have to. Uh, help us to know that there are things that maybe don't fit with a, a, a lifestyle that is connected to you. Lord, impress those things upon us. Give us courage to say, I'm going to leave that behind in Egypt. And I'm going to go forward because I'm going, I'm going to heavenly Canaan. Please, God, give us that which we need to know. Give us the uh, uh, steps forward. If there are people, God, that cross our path this week, help us to see them with your eyes, to know what it is that we need to say to them. You've promised to give us those words. Father, please stick close to us this week as we journey towards the kingdom. May your will be done in our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen and amen. Thank you.